Welcome to Ghostly. Is the Betsy Ross house haunted? Ghostly is a podcast that comes out every other week. In each episode, we take a ghost story or paranormal event and look into its complete history. Rebecca then gives us evidence proving that the story is real. And my job is to debate those pieces of evidence and get you, the listener, prepared to vote on if it's real or not. If you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. And as always, we're your host. I'm Pat. And I'm Rebecca. So, man, this has been crazy busy, but let's just get right into the episode. We'll talk about everything else at the end. Sounds good. So we continue our Most Haunted series today with the Betsy Ross House. It is reported as being one of the most haunted buildings in Philadelphia. So I chose this one because I was really interested in Betsy Ross and that time period in Philadelphia. And then, you know, we looked up that there were definitely some ghost stories about it and that it was considered one of the most haunted. Um, So this was supposedly the site where Betsy Ross designed and sewed the first American flag. Supposedly. Supposedly. Uh, So I was not prepared for all the twists and turns that come along with this story. Uh, I did know prior to doing the research, though, how important it was for the U.S. to have its own flag. Um, So during most of the Revolutionary War, different states would have their own version of the English flag. Okay. And uh, even Washington himself raised different flags when he would win a battle. Interesting. So... I, I feel like it was very important to unify us as a nation and we would need some kind of flag. So that, that was where the flag comes into play. I mean, play. it's an important story. It is an important story. And I don't think many people like um, in the Big Bang Theory, they do the, um, they have this whole flags joke running that Sheldon does a show about flags. Oh. And that it's so boring and so geeky and stuff. <laughs> but this one, I think, is really important for us. All right. So it, ours is not going to be boring or no. geeky at all. No. But <laughs> I hope that you enjoy this episode. So shout outs. We do have a couple shout outs. There are two ways to get us a shout out on Ghostly. What is the first way, Rebecca? Well, of course, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Yeah. I mean, we prefer five-star reviews, but we will read any and all reviews that we receive. And the second way is to become a member on Patreon. Just go to ghostlypodcast.com and click on Patreon in the menu bar. We have a few different tiers to choose from, varying from $1 to $10. And you get a lot. And all of them get a shout out on Ghostly. Absolutely. All right. So we do have a couple five-star reviews. These you probably will not find if you go to Apple Podcasts because these are in the United Kingdom. Well, so, I mean, if you're listening in the United Kingdom. Then you would see them, Then you would see them. So the first one is from Anthony D.N., a super engaging and fun show. Uh, Anthony said, I honestly didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I have. It's a great conversation. I love the fact that when I think of a reason against a story... Patrick will instantly mention it. There you go. I'm guessing he's a hashtag team skeptic. I'm not sure, but I mean, there are some (laughs) stories, you know, that people will, you know, doubt. There you go. All right. Well, and there our other review is from D Larson 2020. Yeah. Also five stars. And it says, keep killing it, guys. Makes you feel super involved as if I am right there when both hosts mention a thought I just had. Amazing content and perspective on these ghost stories. I also love the community you guys are building. Seems like a super fun community to be a part of. Aww. And I think it is. I hope you guys feel that way. Yeah, I, I hope so too. I mean, I, I definitely feel that way. And uh, I know one of the things that you love the most is when two of our Ghostly Society members talk amongst themselves. Yes, that makes me very excited. So yeah, if you're not on our Facebook group, Ghostly Society, please join. Uh, and we are, you know, also with the Patreon doing a lot of fun stuff. So yes. check it out. And we are close to having 700 members on Ghostly Society. Ooh, ooh. Like five away. Oh my gosh. Please join. Yeah, That would absolutely. be a really big accomplishment. <laughs> and we just, we just love it. I mean... You know, we have our Facebook page and stuff where we post a lot of stuff, but we post all that stuff on society, but we talk about it as well. Yeah, a little bit more going on in society. Absolutely. So we do have a couple of new um, patrons on Patreon. Mm -hmm. And the first one is Kim. 
Yep. And the next one is uh, uh, Nuad. Nuad. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. I am not 100 on that. Hopefully we did right. Nuad, if we said that wrong, uh, please get a hold of us and let us know because I'd like to make it right Exactly. For you. Send us a note on Patreon. So, Rebecca, do we have any listener mail? We do. In fact, I'm very excited because I finally made it to the um, uh, post office to oh, get yeah. our mail. It's been a couple weeks because it's been a couple of weeks. Uh, and first of all, I just I have to give a shout out really, really quick to Jacob Mayfield yes. for being an amazing, amazing person uh, who he <laughs> if you uh he was here recording uh, an interview with us for our Patreon only episodes. Um, so be on the lookout for that in the future. Uh, but he sent us a, a, a it's a donkey donkey pinata. pinata, but it's a donkey Dracula or vampire pinata. Yeah. It has fangs on it. It's super adorable. Yeah, and he said like fang you fang, instead fang of you. Fang, thank fang you, thank you, yeah. The, yeah. Super adorable. Thank you so much. That was so cool of him. <laughs> uh, but we also got a few other letters, and you know we love letters. Yeah. So our well, before you say yeah. that though, how can they actually send us a letter? Oh yeah, well you can send us a letter by uh, sending it to PO Box number two six four, Geneva, Illinois six zero one three four. And if you don't remember that, or you're not somewhere where you can write that down, not a big deal. Just go to ghostlypodcast dot com, and it's uh, on the bottom of every page. Yeah. And, you know, if you're not into the whole mailing thing, you can always just email us at uh, info at ghostlypodcast.com. It goes to both me and Rebecca. Or if you want just Rebecca to see it, you could do Rebecca at ghostlypodcast.com or just me if you're a skeptic bro and want to <laughs> proclaim your skepticism. <laughs> you could email pat at ghostlypodcast.com. Pretty easy. Yep. And uh, there's also a contact us form right on the website, too. Yeah, absolutely. We're, again, we need more stories. We love them. So the story that we have today actually came in the mail, uh, and it's from Nicole. So I'm excited to share this with you guys. It says, hello, ghostly crew. I'm currently catching up on past episodes since I sort of bounced around with earlier episodes. Uh, s- episode six, Shadow People, is the episode I'm on. My experience with them, though brief, have left me more confused than frightened. Here we go. Mm. Years ago, I worked for a department store that is well known in the South. And on this day, I had the opening shift. By the way, um, I'm so sorry, Nicole. I don't know if we'll be able to share this, but um, sh- you drew us a very nice um, like layout map of the department store on the back of so the cool. letter and yeah. it's very cool it's, it's it does it does help yeah all right uh okay the area where i worked was the home department which occupied the back of the building my register was in the middle of the department and faced out toward everything so i was able to look out over m- much of the store to my right was the juniors department to the middle jewelry and to the left was shoes and women's clothing This building had square columns that were floor to ceiling mirrors, which were scattered throughout and one happened to be next to the register. It was early when I got in, not everyone had shown up and the store hadn't opened. I think there might've been four of us total inside. Now I will say having worked with this crew for many years, we knew each other's routes and we all stuck to walking the aisles in our departments, meaning we didn't cut through the racks. I had just finished counting my drawer down and had turned towards the column to fix my hair when something caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. What I saw was a figure that was dark, human-shaped, and moved behind the column in the juniors. It caught my attention well enough to turn towards it and wait to see if they would come out the other side. Nothing came out the other side. Nothing moved towards hosiery. I replayed the encounter, questioning what I had just seen, and even after all these years, I can only describe it as a blurred, shadowed figure. I worked there for 10 years, experiencing joys and tragedies, and I never experienced it again or anything out of the ordinary. My second experience was at a house my mother lived in briefly. One night, we were sitting on the couch watching TV when something caught my eye in the hallway. It was close to the floor and shaped more like a clump or ball. I didn't say anything at first, and then it happened again. I mentioned it. My mother simply said, yeah, I've seen them too. 
I didn't much care for that house, aside from the dark, fuzzy ground clumps of the energy was off there. And I found myself having the most bizarre, violent thoughts, which is not normal for me. I later learned that it's possible the area was near the Trail of Tears that went through Arkansas. Oh, my God. Yeah. Could that be a factor? It's possible. Yeah. We have mentioned that in episodes before, but maybe we should do a full episode on that. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's very sad. Though. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I can, <laughs> but yeah. we'll see. Um, yeah, something about. Uh, and then she just says, uh, "Thanks for taking the time to read my experience, Nicole." Uh, well, thank you, Nicole. Uh, we always appreciate getting um, a letter in the mail, and if we are on it and check our <laughs> PO box uh, more frequently, you guys would get preferred treatment. We do. I mean, and yeah. I, you know, I, I, I promise now that the winter weather <laughs> is hopefully going to be receding, uh, I will uh, make it over there a little more regularly. Yeah. So, um, you know what? I don't think we need to do the reviews. I didn't even get them because we've been so busy. So, no, no, not the. We did the reviews. I mean, the the polls. The polls. That's what I no, it's time for the polls. Of course, we got to do the polls. Oh. You never know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. You won last time, so let's be honest. But we were talking about the Screaming Bridge. I mean, come on, that one, oh, jeez. It's called the Screaming Bridge, and there was, I guess, screams, although now I hear it could be Bobcats. Well, I was going to say, we we were told on our uh, Patreon AMA monthly meetup that it's uh, likely Bobcats. Well, we were told, actually, when we went on the Skeptic Psychic, um, which is a, oh, that's what it podcast. was. Yes, that's right. Somebody and else Kim mentioned told it us, too. Yeah. yeah, that's right. We were on Skeptic Psychic, and she mentioned yeah, that. Yeah. So, but there was screams, and there was a bridge. That's true. Well, let's let's just go ahead and and rip all the right, bandaid off right. here. Jeez. Uh, so yes is thirty five percent. So no well, is sixty five percent. Well, how is that possible? I don't know. I th- we were winning uh, the believers towards the beginning, and then I don't know. The skeptics just came out. So listen, if you are out there and you're a believer, um, we have been woefully down in the count um, these last few episodes. So um, I'm just going to put it out there and uh, and say, please, please vote. Actually, I don't. You don't need to be just a believer, but please, please vote. Get out there and vote. Well, I will say that. In this mo- mo- most haunted series, you've not done well. I mean, right? Which is surprising because I thought this would be the series that you would just dominate. I, you know, I mean, the castles I did better. I, I don't understand <laughs> it, but I don't know. I don't know. I think that you know what? I'm gonna be picking some of these upcoming episodes. That's all I'm saying. Okay, I guess. <laughs> I guess. No, it's been fun. And it looks like the overall rating was three point seven. So, I mean, almost to the believer territory, but not really. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, but you know what? I'm in the mood now. Hit me with one of those Rebecca ghost stories. All right, let's do it. Let's get into this episode. Yeah, let's just get into it. All right. It's time for a spooky I want to share a story about something that happened to me that I just can't shake. It touched me deeply and my mind wants to write it down so I don't forget it. I had a day off of work last Tuesday. Just a day. I wanted to take some time for myself and not do any work. Just have fun and relax. I love history, and I remembered going to Betsy Ross's house when I was a child with my school. Living not far out of Philadelphia means that I have a lot of opportunities to learn about American history. That house always stuck in my memory, maybe because it was finally a story about a woman in history. So I thought it might be fun to visit it. As it was a weekday, there really weren't a lot of people there, so I had the opportunity to really explore it and ask questions. It's not a large place, but the people that work there are so knowledgeable about Betsy's life, the Revolutionary War, and the history of the house itself. I feel like I could talk to them forever. We were in the basement when the woman giving me my tour got called upstairs to do something. 
She told me to take my time and look around while she went to do whatever it was she needed to do. So I did. I walked around the space and just tried to imagine what it would have been like so many years ago. They keep some of the old furniture down here like an old bed and some of her favorite sewing items. As I was standing there, just letting myself sink into the memories of what life must have been like in that time of uncertainty, husband at war, no clear idea of who was going to win, I heard some rustling in the corner of the basement. I looked towards the noise and I saw something I will never forget. There was this outlined figure of a woman moving and rustling in the corner. Her movements were odd because they didn't connect to what I saw. As I stared, the figure started to fill in and become brighter. I couldn't believe my eyes. I closed them and shook my head. But when I opened them, the figure of a woman in 18th century dress was still there, moving around. I realized after a moment, it was as if she was cleaning or cooking. I gasped, but she didn't leave. In fact, she turned and started walking toward me. If I could have moved my legs, (laughs) I would have run so fast up those stairs. Luckily, she didn't go too far. She turned towards the bed and sat down. She put her arms on her face, and at at least I think that's what she did. It was hard to tell. And that's when I heard it. Soft crying. I realized all at once that it was her crying for her husband, for this country that was fighting to be, for her daughter that had died. Then she just faded away. I couldn't move for several minutes. I just kept staring, wondering if she was going to reappear. All of the sudden, a voice said, I'm sorry I kept you waiting. I nearly fell out of my skin. It was the museum employee. She asked me if I was all right. I told her what I had just seen. I was ready for her to look at me like I was out of my mind. But instead, she just gave me a knowing nod and said, yes, Betsy likes to be here. I think it reminds her of a very foundational period of her life. She doesn't ever mean to scare or harm anyone. She's just there. I went home that day and just cried not from fear, but from the beauty of witnessing something that connects me to the history I've heard since I was a child. Wow. Okay, so how much of that is based upon real ghost stories? Um, Most of it. You know, that is kind of, those are, we'll talk obviously more about it later, but um, the basement is definitely one of the haunted mm-hmm. spots in the house. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's take a short break. And when we return, we'll get to the pet facts. Pet facts. Pat, what do creepy stories, funny ghost memes, and inside ghostly information have in common? Um, my life. <laughs> well, yes, but no, <laughs> it's also Ghostly Society on Facebook. Oh, yeah. I mean, that too, of course. But aren't all ghostly listeners in Ghostly Society? Not yet. What? I mean, that means that they're missing out on all my jokes. Yeah, they are. And missing out on chatting and sharing with other listeners and us, of course. We love talking to our listeners. If you haven't yet, you should consider joining our private group on Facebook called Ghostly Society. Let's hope now they will. Unless they're a woman in white. You ready, Rebecca? Let's do this. I'm so excited to learn this stuff. It is crazy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So Elizabeth Griscom, um, known 
as Betsy, was born on January 1st, 1752. So she was a New Year's baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. I mean, if she was, you know, born in nowadays times, she might have been the first baby and they might have played it on the Today Show and stuff. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Her parents were Samuel Griscom and Rebecca James Griscom. There's a lot of Rebecca's in this story, too. Ooh, just so you know. nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, Betsy's great grandfather, Andrew Griscom, who was a carpenter, ha- had immigrated in 1680 from England. Okay. So they weren't, you know, the Plymouth Rock, but they were, you know, yeah. they were there for a while. Um, Betsy was born on the Griscom family farm in New Jersey. She had a lot of brothers and sisters. In fact, she was the eighth born of a family that would eventually have 17 children. Oh, my goodness. But Rebecca, sadly, uh, only nine survived childhood. Oh, I guess that's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Only one uh, uh, outlived Betsy, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So two of the seven born before her died before Betsy was even alive. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that that mom went, that Rebecca mom, she went through a lot. She did, definitely. Um, But those were the times, though, then. Yeah. And that's why people would have so many children as well, because a lot of them would die. Yeah. And it was because of all the, you know, elements that people had to go through, because of the sanitation that people had, and because of the diseases that were, I mean, yellow fever and smallpox were, you know, pretty rampant in all those areas. Um, Betsy was only five years old when her sister Martha died. And then another sister, Anne, was born and died at the age of two. Her brothers Samuel I and Samuel II died at the age of three. Jeez. So, yeah, she, um, she, had, she had to go through a lot growing up, I'd imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, two others uh, that were twins, brothers Joseph and sister Abigail, died in one of the frequent smallpox epidemics in the autumn of 1762. That was the best thing ever when we uh, had the uh, (laughs) vaccines and solved the smallpox. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. It saved a lot of lives then. Uh, Betsy grew up into a Quaker household and was raised with Quaker values. At an early age, her great aunt, uh, Sarah Elizabeth Ann Griscom, that's, no, that's a I was name. just thinking, <laughs> well, I'm also just thinking like that is a name. That is a name, yeah. Um, she taught her how to sew. Cool. And uh, after her schooling at a Quaker run state school, Betsy's father apprenticed her to an upholsterer named William Webster. Okay. William Webster is kind of the connection into how. Betsy becomes a Ross. Oh, gotcha. I was going to say, now the Quakers are kind of like the cool Puritans, right? (laughs) Similar. I mean, one of their things that they believe is that God is within everyone and everyone is God. I know they were very anti-slavery and all of that. Like they, you know, they usually... Yeah, a little bit more, but I, I'm sure they were still pretty strict. But like a Quaker nowadays would um, look more similar to like an Amish person okay. in the way that they dress and stuff like that. They're gotcha. very, um, very conservative in dress. Okay. You know? So, um, so anyways, um, Betsy met John Ross, who was a nephew of George Ross Jr., who was actually one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. His parents, Arneas and Sarah, were big in the Church of England, and later the Episcopal Church. So much so that Aeneas was a priest and an assistant rector of the Christ Church. So that was big. I mean, they obviously, I mean, I mean, the Episcopal Church is kind of like the, I think, the American version of the Church of England. But yes. Yeah. It is, and the Christ Church it, more specifically. Okay. And there were different uh, factions of it, and this is, um, we're going to find out that it led them to different things. Too. Gotcha. Um, so this kind of relationship was unheard of in its day. Quakers hardly ever dated outside their religion. Let alone, you know, yeah. Yeah. Get, get with them. So, I mean, that was bad. Yeah. So they decided to elope. 
Ooh. Which I'm sure you can tell it caused a split in the Griscom family. Oh, that's so sad. So, um, Betsy, now Betsy Ross. Uh Aha. Betsy and John um, joined the Christ Church themselves. Okay. And uh, they started their own upholstery business around the same time. Uh, During their time at the Christ Church, they would have made several visits to um, the colony of Virginia to see the regimental commander, the colonel, and a soon-to-be general named George Washington. Oh, really? Did they do work for him or... George Washington's family, I'm not sure if he was, but George Washington's family were part of the uh, Christ Church. Oh, gotcha. Through the church then. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It was, it was very much, that was like one of the ends in this. Gotcha. Thing, so. so Betsy and John Ross had no children, though. Mm. Uh, when the American Revolutionary War began, Betsy and John Ross had been married for just two years. And John Ross was a member of the local militia named the Pennsylvania Provincial Militia. John Ross was assigned to guard munitions. Now, records were not that great during the Revolution, so I am not sure how, but John Ross died in 1775. Yeah, I can see that the records might not have been, you know, real detailed. Well, there was a lot of people that died. So according (laughs) to one legend, though, he was killed by a gunpowder explosion But family sources have have doubt about this claim. Gotcha. So not sure. Yeah, they're not exactly sure. So I don't know for sure. And I don't know an exact date because there's so many people that died during that. Just that year. Yeah. So Betsy now 24 and she continued to work in their upholstery business. She would repair uniforms and make tents, blankets and stuffed paper tube cartridges with musket balls for prepared package packaged ammunition in 1779 for the Continental Army. Wow. They're Uh, definitely a patriot. Definitely she was. Um, And if you think of it, yeah, she was just 24 years old when the revolution started. So, Mm -hmm. Um, On June 15th, 1777, Betsy married again. And her second husband was a sailor by the name of Joseph Ashburn. Uh, That didn't work out too well, though. (laughs) <laughs> um, Ashburn's ship was captured by the Royal Navy and Ashburn was charged with treason. This is because the English didn't yet recognize the American colonial citizenship. So they imprisoned him at Old Mill Prison in England. Oh, wow. So during the time that he was in jail, Betsy and Ashburn's first child died at the age of nine months. And Betsy gave birth to their second daughter named Eliza. Oh, So Ashburn died in jail. And three years after that, in May of 1783, Betsy got married again. (laughs) Uh, This time to a man by the name of John Claypool, which is weird because he actually met Ashburn in the old mill prison. Okay. And what's even weirder is Claypool was actually the person that told Betsy about Ashburn dying. I don't think it's that weird. (laughs) I have a feeling he met... Uh, Ashburn and you know they they were friendly whatever whatever you could be in prison and then he killed him uh, no but I okay. think once he died he was probably like and then he got out of prison he was like I need a wife yeah you know Ashburn talked <laughs> real nicely about that Betsy she sounded pretty mm. pretty sweet so yeah. I trust me he didn't just like randomly run into Betsy mm. he went with the express purpose of Telling her the news, quote unquote, and yeah, you had your fingers up, in yeah, quotes there. and then, uh, yeah, wooing mm-hmm. her. So they had five more daughters. So he wooed her a lot. <laughs> uh, Clarissa, Susanna, Jane, Rachel, and Harriet, who actually died early on. Okay. Um, in 1793, her mother, father, and sister Deborah Gri- Griscom Bolton. Um, all died in another severe yellow fever epidemic, a disease unknowingly caused by infected mosquitoes. Mm. So after two decades of poor health, John Claypool died in 1817. And uh, Betsy continued the upholstery business for 10 more years. Wow. So she really lost. I mean, I guess maybe more of her kids survived, but, you know, she lost a lot of family there. Yeah, definitely. 
Uh, after Betsy retired, she ended up going blind. And uh, she lived with her daughters, uh, first with Clarissa and then with Jane. Clarissa took over the upholstery business oh. when she retired. On Saturday, January 30th, 1836, 60 years after the Declaration of Independence, Betsy Ross died at the age of 84. Now, Betsy's body was first interred at the Free Quaker Burial Grounds on North 5th Street in Philadelphia. In 1856, though, the remains of Betsy and her third husband, John Claypool, were moved from the Free Quaker Burying Grounds to Mount Murray Cemetery. And this is interesting fact. Mm -hmm. The practice of cemeteries purchasing the remains of, of famous historical individuals was common in order to drive additional business. Oh, jeez. Like, don't you want to be buried by Elvis? Yeah, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Daughters of the American Revolution um, erected a flagpole at the site of her grave in her memory. In 1975, in preparation for the American Bicentennial, city leaders ordered the remains moved to the courtyard of the Betsy Ross house. So for the third time, or a second time, she was moved. Maybe. Ooh. Because when they um, actually, when cemetery workers uh, went to go uncover these remains, they found no remains oh. beneath her tombstone. But bones found elsewhere in the family plot were deemed to be hers and were reinterred in the current grave visited by tourists at the Betsy Ross house. So there's no saying if that is actually Betsy Ross. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, 75, it's not like they had DNA. Like, yeah. So they were just like, yeah, these look like her bones. So that is one of the first <laughs> twists in this story. Oh, we'll be coming back to that one. But there is more, <gasps> though, let me tell you. Uh-oh. So... Uh, let's talk about the house a little bit, right? Okay, so we got Betsy's story. We haven't talked about yeah. the flag yet. We're going to talk about that in uh, relation to oh, the house. Okay. okay. Uh, so the Betsy Ross house is a house in Philadelphia. Can we agree to that? We can agree to that. Okay. It is supposed to be the site where Betsy lived when she said, when she was said to have designed and sewn the first American flag. That is what they say. That is what they say. Ah. <sighs> There are some problems with this story, though. <laughs> we went um, back to the the records weren't very well kept. No, it's this is. Uh, I don't know. Anyways, um, so <laughs> uh, the first problem is that she might not have actually lived there. Um, they may have the wrong house. Oh, great! Yeah, it's hard to tell now, though, uh, as this all began. Back in 1876. Oh, no, that dates, uh, that year seems to have an important ring It does, to it. yeah, yeah. Um, so it was the centennial, mm -hmm. and people were really into the Revolutionary War. I mean, they went like crazy with all this stuff. Well, it had like, been 100 years, right? It's 100 so years. So they were like, yeah, we got to celebrate. They were super interested in every detail about the war yeah. and anybody surrounding the war. Uh, so they asked Betsy's grandson, William, and George Canby where the house was located. The best archival evidence indicates that the house would have been adjacent to the one that still stands today at as the Betsy Ross house. Okay, so it's not like we're saying this was like way far no, away. No, no, it's it was just close. like next door. It's close. Okay. Um, so the 1937 Philadelphia Guide noted that after the current Betsy Ross house was selected as the flag house, the adjacent building where Ross may have indeed lived was torn down to lessen the hazards of fire, perhaps <laughs> adding a touch of irony to what may well have been an error in research. Ooh. So the house sits on Arch Street, several blocks from Independence Hall, and the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The front part of the building was built around 1740 in the Pennsylvania colonial style, with the stair hall and the rear section added 10 to 12 years later. Had she lived here, Ross would have resided in the house from 1776 to the death of her first husband, John Ross, until 1779. 
So, so they're saying when she lived there was when she was married to John Ross or like around that time. Yes. Okay. So if she lived there mm-hmm. and yeah, she that was that was around the time when somebody was commissioned to make the flag. Okay. So that's where they're actually pointing to too okay. with, with these dates. Gotcha. But she was only there for three years though. So, um, okay. so the second reason why what we know as the Betsy Ross house was not the house that she lived in when she s- sewed the first American flag is that she more than likely didn't design the first flag at all. Well, I guess I never thought that she designed the flag. I just thought she sewed the flag. She might not have sewed the first flag either. Well, okay. I'm interested to hear what you have to say, and then we can chat about it. Okay, so the problem dates back to 1876 again. Mm -hmm. Uh, As I said, people were really into the American Revolutionary War. People were drinking the Kool-Aid, believing everything they heard of the history at that moment. Uh, It's during this time when Betsy Ross was first credited with making the first flag a hundred years after it was reportedly made. Okay. Um, William Canby. That was the grand, one of the grandsons. Yeah, that was one of the grandsons, or the great-grandsons. Mm-hmm. William Canby said that Betsy had often recounted a visit she had received in late May or early June of 1776 from three men, General George Washington, um, financer of the Revolutionary War, Robert Morris, and, and Colonel George Ross. Does that name sound familiar? It does sound familiar. That is a relative. Right, because yeah. Ross, right? The signer. And all the, okay, okay. So that would be another connection too. And he supposedly begged for her to do that if she did it, you know. Um, so during this meeting, she was allegedly presented with a sketch of a flag that featured 13 red and white stripes and 13 six-pointed stars and was asked if she could create a flag to match the proposed design. Well, Betsy agreed, but suggested a couple of changes, including arranging the stars in a circle and reducing the points on each star to five instead of six. I guess that would have been easier for her to sell. Well, I think, yeah, just like a... In general, just kind of for not just for her, but for anyone. Like, if you want, I mean, back then it's not like you're mass producing flags. So it's like yeah. you want to make it easy for people to reproduce. But this is problematic, though, for the history of our great flag uh, when we can't really be sure where it came from at all because it wasn't credited to her until 100 years after it was made, after she was long gone and couldn't be like, yeah, I did it. Right. I guess we do have, though, the family, you know, reports. I mean, it's not that many generations. So, I mean, you could see. That where... was her great grandson. I thought it was, I thought it was grandson. No, great. And so. Hmm. But even still. Okay. So tell me something that your great grandmother did. Okay. She loved <laughs> wrestling, is yeah. what I am told. Like, she would sit in her back bedroom. And like the whole family would be having like their family parties mm. and she just would watch wrestling, which I just love that concept because I don't. But I just think that's funny. Yeah. She would have known all the names that right. me and Bob bring and up. And she was a good, um, she was like a farmer, but she wasn't really a farmer. Anyways, there's, there, I have stories. What did she do for a living? Uh, she was a farmer. Okay. So I can tell you nothing about what my great grandparents <laughs> did. Nothing at all. I mean, I certainly don't know all of my great grandparents, but I do have stories. Like it's not that crazy because it's like this is this is my my parents' grandparents. So like yeah. they have stories about their grandparents. But in those days too, when somebody died, they like dropped them. They tried to forget them. Oh, I don't know if that's they did. Tr- well, if they, they were did. it would depend who you're who you're if you're if you think your family like had connections to the revolution, maybe yeah, you wouldn't maybe. have. Maybe, but so, um, interesting enough, a woman by the name of Rebecca Young uh, made something that looked very similar with the British with the British Union Jack and the crosses of Saint George and Saint Andrew in the part where the stars would be. It had thirteen alternating red and white stripes for the United Colonies. Oh yes, no, let's change this. I agree. Rebecca Young 
made the flag. <laughs> That's absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess, you know, after all is said and done, it really doesn't matter much. The Betsy Ross House is a landmark that sits on Arch Street, and it is blocks away from Independence Hall, that is true, and the Liberty Bell. And it is one of the most visited tourist sites in Philadelphia. Um, so those are all true things to that story. Yes. Now, the only thing, just one question before you kind of finish up here is, so it is interesting because she, she was married three times. Three times. Had th- Did she change her name? Um. So she did go by Ashburn too. So that was another alias for her, but... She is best known as Betsy Ross. It's just kind of interesting. Like that seems like a pointed thing that her her family must have those grandsons when they were great grandsons, whatever. When they were spinning this story, they purposely, even though like they were maybe more descendant from Claypool, most likely, right? Because that's where she had the most kids. Yeah, but like Ross was who who had the connection to George Washington. Yep, is from that that man from John Ross, that husband. So they like called her Ross, yeah. which like seems surprising. Like you'd think they'd want their name to be a, so like it's Betsy Claypool, you know, whatever. Like that's our family name, but they went with Ross. So that's, so, that's interesting. You want to hear another interesting story? Yes. About Betsy Ross. <laughs> this, this is a little bit oh, crazy. No. <laughs> I'm worried. So after John Ross died, uh-huh, she is um they're suspected okay is the best word i i can use alleged alleged maybe, okay to be somebody that seduced one of the german soldiers uh cuz germany was here too like they were hi- the they were like hired soldiers they right? were hired soldiers they were the, like england like hired people the hessian the hessians or whatever they were yeah, yeah so um seduced one of them into not going to a battle the next day. Oh, I've and totally so, heard that story with George Washington. Yeah, and that was one of the battles that we might have lost. That like it was if like it a turning for, point. If it wasn't for Betsy Ross and her seductive ways. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Go Betsy. I don't know if that's true or not. I though, just so. like that story. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> she did she did it for her country. She did it for her country. She didn't marry that guy. No. So I'm just gonna say. <laughs> so I, I just want to go over some of the more modern things about the house. Okay. If that's okay. Uh the house has had a few structural changes. Okay. In 1937, the house was in dire need of some repair, and uh, a radio mogul, A. Atwater Kent. Oh, I've heard that name. Yeah, yeah he paid $25,000 to restore the house. That was in 1937. Um, so just to put some perspective in that, my parents bought my house in Chicago in 1976 for $35,000. So bought a complete house for ten thousand dollars more, and this is this is forty years before that, and just just restorations alone. Just restorations. So I mean, imagine that was, that's probably like a million dollars today. I, I I don't even know. Yeah, that, I mean, it's a crazy amount. Um, so they tried to keep the house, and this is one of the reasons why it costs so much too. Mm-hmm. They tried to keep the house as original as possible. Um, when they did have to make repairs, they used materials from demolished houses of that time period oh it, oh that's cool yeah so okay. th- i mean even though it might not be the same bricks it's, it is bricks from that time period right gotcha so um the doorway was moved to the opposite side of the house and a new window was installed i can find no reason why <laughs> well there must have been one there is an old picture where it it has the house with the door on the left and it says um, above it, the house of, or the home of old glory or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. And then the next picture you see is the doors on the right. There you go. And I'm like, and there's, the window's completely different. Like there was like a storefront before and now it's like a house. Yeah, I did read something about that, that, you know, that house, how it operated back in the day was, um, you know, you would like, 
different people would have their businesses in the home. Yeah. It was it was like stores, but yet you would live there too. Well, that's probably where her upholstery business. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now, I will say too, in relation to the flag making, she did make flags. Okay, so she. This is not like a totally crazy concept. Even if she didn't make the first one, yeah. or and maybe she just suggested a five point star thing. We don't know. But there are receipts. She did make flags. There are receipts that say that she made flags. Okay. She was never paid for making Old Glory. Gotcha. Um, okay, so um, Kent also bought the two adjacent properties to create a civic garden. Oh, yeah, there is a nice space around there. There is, yeah. Then in 1941, the house was given to the city of Philadelphia, and they added the annex building in 1965 and added a fountain in 1974. Very pretty. Yeah. A private non nonprofit organization, a private nonprofit organization, Historic Philadelphia Inc., began leasing the property from the city of Philadelphia in 1995 and continue to manage the site to this day. That's great. Yeah. Um, I have not been there, but looking at the website, they've got, you know, lots of tours and just so much information on there that uh, definitely um, should I be lucky enough to make it to Philadelphia one day, which is definitely on my on my list. Uh, I will definitely check it out. I would imagine that it wouldn't really take too long to actually tour the house. Yeah, it's not super big. So it's just a nice little Nice little place to go. No, in fact, um, when she did marry Claypool and stuff like that, they had to move into a much bigger house because they had kids. Yeah, kids, and hopefully their upholstery business was uh, booming. Yeah, I don't know. I know nothing about the success of the business at all. It was <laughs> well, it was going long enough for her daughter to take it over. So I'm going to yeah, take that as a success. And a seamstress and stuff during those days would have, you know, made a good penny, especially amongst the Quakers. Because yeah, the Quakers she, made all of their own clothes. That's true. Did she reconcile with her family? Um, I don't know. I don't know. But she was buried in a Quaker cemetery. I was thinking that, that there must have been something that happened over the years. Yeah, I would say her being buried in a Quaker cemetery, they must have forgiven her for her. Yeah. You know, I mean, but then again... Think of all the trauma that they went through and her parents died. Um, so, I mean, her parents might have still had grievances to her. But right, her, but the her, church maybe. But her like, I think one sister was living when she died. Gotcha. So, um, yeah. And her one sister um, probably forgave her and stuff. I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't know exactly how that works, but, um, and, you know, there's not many details. And unfortunately, the story doesn't cover any of the emotional parts of when her husbands died or any of her family members, like it does with like Abraham Lincoln, that we know how distraught he was. It doesn't tell anything like that. Yeah, I couldn't really find like letters or things. I mean, they no. might exist, but um, the, uh, yeah, it wasn't like she was a, like Lincoln or something where she was a known historical figure well, during again, her lifetime where people like would think to preserve hers. Again, so. so maybe she didn't make the first flag. Well, but, but then again, you know, you think about it, know. our country is brand new. Everything is brand new then too. Yeah. So, I mean, eyes would have been on like, I know uh, as far as Supreme Court justices, George Washington holds the record and will never be beat on how many Supreme Court justices that he, <laughs> because, he because of how we pick, do it. Yeah, he had yeah. to pick them all. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's like, um, and like uh, other things, like where the White House was and where this, I mean, all, all this stuff was happening at that time. And um, ev everything was a first. So maybe the first flag wasn't as big of a deal to them. And maybe, and, and the thing is too, I could see that there were maybe many flags made and then it wasn't really decided on which flag was the flag for a little while yet. No, George Washington said that was the flag. Okay. He was one of the people that was like, nope, that's it. Uh, well, I mean, whatever he said was definitely going to be what people accepted. I don't even know if a lot of the stuff that he said had to go in front of Congress. I mean, pretty much they offered George Washington to be the king of the United States. They and did. He, and he said no. We owe him Wait a bit. And anything that did go in front of Congress when he was president was because he wanted it to go in front of him. And he then that set the rules mm -hmm. for how how things are today. Yeah. 
So very interesting bit of history um, that might or might not have happened. <laughs> uh, we have no way of knowing. And um, although a lot of historians seriously doubt the fact that she made the flag or lived in that house. <laughs> So, again, our most haunted series is Cursed, I think. Oh, we haven't gotten to the ghost stories yet. Should we do a, is the most haunted series Cursed? <laughs> we, could, we could think about it. We got a couple. We got this one and at least one one more, right, after this? Yes. So we'll, Spoiler we'll alert. Yeah. I was going to say that at the very oh, end. Oh, I'm sorry. But yeah. Uh, yes, we do have one more. Okay. All right. Um, let's take a break. And when we return, we'll get to that debate. We are excited to announce a new way you can support Ghostly. Joining us on Patreon. There are many reasons to become a patron. Not only are you helping Ghostly cover its own cost, but you can get Ghostly episodes early. You can get up to 25% off Ghostly gear. Get a shout out on the next episode. You can get a priority request for a new episode. Get more Rebecca's creepy bedtime stories. And the biggest news, you can get exclusive content with our new show called Ghostly X for the weeks that Ghostly does not have a new episode. As well as many more cool rewards that we can't wait to share with our patrons. So please, help us become the podcast that we've always wanted to be. You can sign up by going to ghostlypodcast.com and clicking on the Patreon link on the menu bar. Rebecca, I think it's time for a debate. Definitely. All right. <laughs> Let's hear it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So I'm sorry. Pat has decided to hold up a ghostly flag pennant, uh, also uh, given to us by Jacob Mayfield, <laughs> who made it mm -hmm. uh, for our um, Dark Matters Winter Tales podcast festival. <laughs> this yeah. past weekend so it has ghostly uh on one side and a little picture of a ghost on the other side are you going to use it um as like a ghost no ghost yeah <laughs> so it's always going to stay like this where it says just ghostly just ghostly not, ghost, not the ghost is a ghost yeah. okay all right <laughs> and he did a great drawing of a ghost too well actually i think it was shane that did the shane, actual like shane writing is amazing. And the, so that yeah. may which which i think uh, makes sense. So. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so, okay. The, we're actually going to start with something. So here's the thing. So this house, as you said, Betsy may or may not have lived there, um, but th it has been a house <laughs> since the 1700s. Yeah, it has. And people have lived there, worked there. It has been in existence and things have happened there. Okay. So we're actually going to start with a more modern um, Ooh. violent thing that Ooh, happened violent. in this house. Ooh, wow. <laughs> Not joking. In 1980, two security guards for the home got into an altercation in the basement of the gift shop. Mm. The fight turned really bad when one of the guards pulled out his gun and shot the other three times. At least he didn't shoot a log. <laughs> right, that's true. Mm. Leaving him overnight in the shop to die. Since then, visitors have claimed to hear disembodied voices coming from the area where the murder took place. Uh, ghost hunters, so taps, um, they did a whole episode at the Betsy Ross house and they tried to see, you know, what they could find. And during their investigation, they did capture those disembodied voices throughout the house. Um, and one of them came from the basement. A man moaning is what they could hear. Okay. Well, I'm thinking it's a very old house. Okay. 
And I think uh, old houses can creak, especially one that has had as much restoration as this one. Mm. Uh, so I'm thinking it's because, I mean, when, when a house creaks, it can sound like moaning almost. It's scary sometimes when you hear it. Yeah, but again, I don't know. I mean, like, I think most people could discern like moaning from and I voices can't, from creaking. I can't, Rebecca. So therefore, I am giving it a <laughs> giving it a ghostly. I'm giving it a ghostly and not a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I don't get to be ghostly. All right, what's your what's your uh, rating for this um, one? My rating on this one would be a zero. Interesting. I'm giving this one an eight. An eight. Yes, I'm an sorry. Eight all day? I'm start eight all day. We're we're starting strong. Whoa! Violence happening, uh, and we've got you know um, uh, disembodied voices. All you know recorded. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> this next story. I actually think this might be my favorite ghost story of ever of ever. It's it's up there. Wow. We're gonna have to see. I, I love everything about it. Okay. Well, my stick is better than bacon, though. <laughs> okay. You can Google that okay. for for a fun laugh. All right. In the director's office, which is in the attic of the home, one former director felt a large hand grab onto her shoulder roughly, and was so frightened by the experience. <laughs> That she climbed out of the window and Whoa. onto the flagpole outside, too afraid to cross the room to escape down the steps. Uh, <laughs> so history says that one of the house's former owner, um, and I can't remember, the name is escaping me. I forgot to put it in here. It begins mm -hmm. with an M. Um, or maybe it was a different one. Who knows? So former owner died in that room that is that office. Um, and ghost hunters did capture a man's voice in this office during their investigation, but they couldn't really make out the words that he was saying. But yes, so the the director, and this is from the, like, when, when Ghost Hunters was there, like, the current director was like, yes, the former director felt this hand on her shoulder and escaped out the window down the flagpole. Interesting. Is that what you would do if you felt a... A hand on your shoulder? Would you just escape out the window rather than crossing over to the door? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd have better chance facing the the ghost one on one <laughs> than trying to get out the yeah. window. Yeah, than trying to get out the window and go down a flagpole like That's a fireman. The, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm hoping it was summertime. That's all. I'm, I know. Actually, do I? Do I hope it was summertime? <laughs> Maybe I don't. Actually, mm -hmm. I guess we'll say fall or spring. Fall or spring. That would be okay. Well, it is Philadelphia, so there could be snow on the ground if it was winter. So that would be less of a fall. Then. That's true, but it would be very, very cold on that flagpole. Yeah, don't stick your tongue on it. This That's is what I'm sure. saying. Or in the winter, it could be like fire um, hot. So... You know, I, I think that's really interesting because when I've done research into this house, so um, after Betsy left, I don't see many deaths in the house until that one in 1980, oddly enough. So, yeah. I mean, you got to figure because people were only living in this house until 1886 because once they declared that this was the Betsy Ross house, Conveniently, nobody was living there at the time, too. Um, so, it, you know, the, like, you got to say probably 80 years out of that time, people were actually living in the house. Mm -hmm. But so, we also established how many people died back then. So it's not like impossible someone could have died in the house. It's not, but I don't see anything about that, though. Mm -hmm. Like the address, you, you look it up and I don't see much about that. Okay. Yeah. So what are we thinking about this woman? She just felt that, but it wasn't oh, really there. And that part of the building wasn't even built until 17. Um, that, that wasn't even built till like the 1800s. Right. But we're not saying this is Betsy doing this. I know. I know. But I'm just saying, though, I'm trying to think of what are the like how many people would have lived there. So maybe maybe the house was occupied for 60 years mm -hmm. and i just think that the likelihood of somebody dying in the house 
that would leave a ghost is is unlikely. Okay. So I'm going to have to go low on this one, but I'm going to go one because I don't know many of the details. I There's no videotape of this. There's no um, photos of this. So it's hard to go by. It's just one person's word. But her, the only reason why I go a one instead of a zero, though, is because her actions were so crazy. Right. I mean, and, and, and you know, this is not just like a whatever person. This is like the director of the place. Yeah. So she, it wasn't like she was just trying to sneak out early or something like right, that. Right, right. But I mean. And they do not trade on this haunted thing. I mean, like the the house itself. I will say, what? like, there's nothing on the. They don't trade on it. Yeah, like the website. There's oh, no okay. like, come see the ghost of Betsy Ross. Like, no, no. I mean, like, there might be haunted tours that do that, but yeah. the house itself does not. There, you will not find anything about any of this on their website. No, they want to sure. be taken seriously, and I don't think that they're making money off of this. I think that she felt like something happened. I I think that she believed that it happened. But I just, unfortunately, there's nothing to go by on this story except for her word. Mm -hmm. And it could be anything. I'm giving this one a seven. I'm giving this one a one. Giving it a one. All right. And I'm going to say. (laughs) Ghostly. Ghostly, not. All right. Well, I say ghost. Um, No, especially with this one, because, again, such a strong reaction for somebody and the fact that they um, captured um, a voice in there. All right. Number three, um, people report seeing a woman crying at the foot of a bed in the basement. Um, some believe this is Betsy Ross crying over her lost husband and daughter, but there's definitely no like proof for sure who this woman is. Just that there people say that they've seen a woman, um, the figure of a woman crying, sitting on that bed. Going back to my story at the beginning, I have also read um, about like, seeing a woman doing like cleaning and work down there. Um, but more, much more common is this seeing her sitting on the bed um, crying. Okay. Well, obviously this is not Betsy because the chances of her living in that actual place is very, very low. Right. But um, she's buried there. We think that is something that I, I do not think so. <laughs> I do not think her remains. Now, Claypool, I didn't see. I don't think they found either of their remains. So I don't I don't think that they're buried there. They found bones nearby that they're just like, yeah, these so are maybe probably it's them. the weird nearby bones. I don't know. Something happened and I'd be upset. That's all okay. I'm saying. Well, no, I do not believe that this is true. And also the bones or the not bones or whatever it was. <laughs> Um, would not have been there when anybody was living there. Oh, are we stealing the bones or not bones? <laughs> <laughs> it's not bones. <laughs> so I'm going to go zero on this okay. one. Okay, I'm going to go, I'm actually going to go five on this one. Well, I'm also thinking too, is that people know the story of Betsy Ross when they go to the house. The tragic story of Betsy Ross, some would say, I, I would say it's more triumphant. I was going to say, know. I don't know that I often hear tragic, but I mean, she certainly had tragedy in her life. Yes. So they would think that, you know, she would be grieving over her husband and mm-hmm. stuff. And I I think that's a disservice to um, women there because I think she was a lot stronger than that. Mm-hmm. I mean, not that she wouldn't grieve. Everybody grieves. But I just don't think that she would be the kind of person that you would find crying over well, she, her bed. She certainly kept herself moving forward, made her own Seducing way in the world. Seducing generals and... Yeah, making munitions and stuff. And, yeah. yeah, so... Um, all right, and then our last one here for today. Um, <laughs> this is just a weird one. I'm not quite sure where this comes from, but um, in the parlor of the home where Betsy is said to have met with the U.S. Flag Committee... Witnesses state that they feel a very dark and foreboding presence in the room with them. So I don't know. I don't really, I don't quite understand that connection. Like to me, that's like a pretty positive meeting. Like yeah. if, let's just say it did happen, right? Like why would that make it dark and foreboding then? In I that don't room? know. I don't know. And I mean, unless it's like all the people that, 
would die during the revolution. I mean, War? maybe, I, yeah. I, I guess I can't. I just to me that if there is a dark and foreboding presence in that room, I don't think it has anything to do with Betsy Ross. It's an old, old house. I right. mean, it. You know, it's. I would imagine that it's pretty um, basic inside because, like, thinking of some of the pictures of older houses like this, they usually keep it very minimal. Well, what I had read was when it was f- very, very first built, it that that style is basically one room on each floor, yeah. and then the stairs went up in like the middle or something yeah. like that. So it was really just like a room. And they actually moved the stairs when they did the renovation. Right, because so. then they added, yeah. Maybe that's so. the reason why they moved the door. I don't know why they moved that door. That <laughs> still bothers it me. It really is sticking to him. He, that was something you mentioned in your research when you were doing yeah. it. You are like, they moved the door. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to go zero on this one because, you know, it's one of those kind of things. I heard it from this person. I heard it from that person mm-hmm. that I, you know, and sure, there might be multiple people that say this, but I don't have any names. I don't have Names give credibility to a story because people are willing to put their name to it. That's this is true. this is a nameless story. Yeah. Nameless stories always rank lower for me. I'm actually going to give this a 4. Again, yeah, there's a few people that say it, but I don't this I don't even think that the tap team found this one. So, uh so yeah, not not real high on this one. Okay. So, what would you say is your overall rating for Betsy Ross House? My overall rating is going to be a zero on this one. Um, I, I just don't think there's enough evidence to say that there is anything there. Um, all right. My overall rating is going to be a seven. A seven. Okay. I know I went low with the last one, but most of mine were was like eight and a seven, a six, kind of up there. So uh, I really, like to me, the the basement seems like it's got something going on because you had a murder there and, you know, again, the woman crying down there, there could be, I mean, we may not know who these spirits are, but they're there. Um, and then we have the, the that poor director up in that room um, going out the, the window like that. That's pretty extreme to me. So, um, so yeah, I gotta, I gotta go with a seven. All right. Well, that brings us to the closing arguments. This is our last chance to convince you to vote our way. We are each given one in, one minute of uninterrupted time, and we will time each other on our cell phones to keep Rebecca honest. Hey. Rebecca, are you ready? I am ready. All right. I have one minute on the clock, and I will start it now. All right. So I think that the Betsy Ross house is haunted. I, you know, I, it's one of those things like I think that I don't know that anything there is malicious. Um, I think it's a very old house that's seen a lot, including, you know, um, going through a few wars um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and got a lot of attention. Even if Betsy Ross didn't live there, didn't make flags there, people took it as that's what that house was. So it has been given a lot of energy um, since then. And then this murder happens there. Like I just, to me, I am going to give it, Oh, I'm, I am going to give it a ghost, a ghost. I'm giving it a ghost. I do think um, that this one is haunted. Wow. Uh, again, we have some investigators finding stuff and we have a woman going down a flagpole. Uh, yes, it's haunted. All right. You had three seconds, Rebecca. I did. Okay, you want to cede those three seconds to me? Uh, no, <laughs> we do not get that. Um, all, right. all right, are you ready? Why are you still holding the flag? Because I want you to see and look at. No, I'll put the flag down. I'll okay, give you the put flag. the flag down. All right, this is this is a flag episode. So. <laughs> okay, we'll have to. Well, there's a. You can see Jacob with the picture of the flag online. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I'm gonna. Are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, here we go. All right, so when we're talking about the history of this house, there's a lot of things that are problematic and questionable. Um, I don't know what I can say about it, and I question everything to do with this house because of that. It's This is not a good example. If there, Even if there was ghost, this is not a good example of a place that you should give your vote to because I believe that you are rewarding then this erroneous research and erroneous history that is presented in the house. And I'm all about the history. No ghost, 
I'm all about the history, <laughs> and I'm done. Okay. Well, you didn't need my seconds then. You you mm-hmm. had plenty left. Yeah, for I you. did definitely. So I want to thank everyone so much for listening. Please share us with your friends and family, as word of mouth is our best form of ad- advertisement. Remember to hit that subscribe button if you don't already subscribe. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about dark matters. So yeah. we did a pod fest in Elgin at Side Street Studio Arts. Thank you, Side Street. Thank for, you so much, Side Street. Um, and we were co-producers in this. And it was a pretty good turnout. I think so. Now, yeah. Now, let me for ask you this, annual. Rebecca. Let me ask you this. Yes. If you could see five podcasts and get a free reading from the Mayfields, mm-hmm. actually one by each, let's say, and um, you could also be part of a paranormal investigation and learn how to do a paranormal investigation mm-hmm. on your own. Yeah. How much value would you put to that? How many dollars would you put to that? Like 50 bucks. Right? I mean, I think that this could have sold for a lot more money. Mm-hmm. But you know what? We charge ten dollars. Ten dollars. It was so so uh, affordable. Yeah. Um. We had great podcasts there. Bad Taste, uh, Crime Podcast. We had yes. uh, Radio Lucifer. We had um, Graphic Tales, and um. You might have heard of the other one, Bob. Bob, Bob after dark. Something. No, <laughs> we had Bob after dark. Yeah. Uh, actually, I mean, if we're gonna be biased, I think Friday night. Bob After Dark and Ghostly it was the better night. No, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, well, everything was Bob, good. Bob did have a very special guest. And I, you know what? I really agreed with this person. <laughs> yes. Uh, unfortunately, Count Panic couldn't be there. So Pat uh, stepped in and yeah. took his place uh, as uh, Bob's co-host for the night. So um, you'll be able I, I to just hear wanna, Pat I just want to say episode. one thing that we talked about. Mm-hmm. We talked about a mantis man, which is a praying mantis that's a man, seven feet tall, mm-hmm. and he was wearing overalls and carrying a wand. I mean, if that isn't an advertisement for listening to a Bob After Dark episode, right? I don't know what is. I mean, come on. That was just, I mean, I totally believe that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had, it was a, it was a really fun project. And, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping that um, just in the future, Ghostly's going to get to do some more live things. So yeah. keep and an in eye fact, out. We are. On Sunday, March 6th. Yeah, that's true. If you missed us this weekend, next weekend. March 6th, we will be uh, with Jack Chavez for the Chicago Paranormal Convention in Summit. Paracon. Yeah, in um, in Summit, Illinois. Yeah, so definitely check that out. Um, it's uh, You can find it on our Facebook page. That's true. We've, we've linked out to it. Yeah. So. Um, and in society, we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, if you're not a part of society, you should be because it seriously is a lot of fun. We've built a community there. Every once in a while, I will drop a link to our discord server on there too. Yeah. We hope you join us on there. Yeah. And we've been having a lot of fun there and that is really the way you can get in touch with us almost all the time. Except for when we're sleeping or working or (laughs) doing our taxes or something, you know, those would probably be times we wouldn't respond. Yeah. But um, so we will be concluding our Most Haunted series with one more from L.A. L.A. is one of our top areas where we get downloads from. And one of the most haunted. So I wanted to reward them Mm -hmm. by giving them two episodes. All right. So we did the Entity House. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're going to be doing Bella Lugosi's apartment. Ooh! And I'm working on getting us a very special guest for that one—one one that's never been on Ghostly <gasps> New before. New guest alert! Yeah, and one that may be a little skeptical. <gasps> oh <that>. no! <laughs> <laughs> but that is on the next episode that comes out on March 16th, and on the next Ghostly X, we will be talking with um, Jacob Mayfield. Yes. So if you are not a part of our Patreon, it's really easy. It's affordable and you get two bonus episodes of Ghostly every month yeah. at least. And uh, there's options. for. There's a lot of options out there. A lot of special things you can get. Yeah. Um, we we uh, are so excited for all the things that we're going to start to be able to do with Ghostly because of your support. 
Um, and uh, we thank you so much for those that already have and that those that join in the future. We could definitely use more because the more that we get, the more we can do for Ghostly. Absolutely. We already have a secret project we're going to be um, releasing out very soon. Very soon. Uh, it's going to be short. <laughs> but it'll be really soon. Um, and uh, we're really excited about that. We can always use more support, though, uh, to do even more. In fact, one of the tiers that we have on um, on the Patreon allows you to be able to do a meeting with us every month where we meet as a group. And we had such a great time in the last one. Yeah, and and if the and we uh, the and ghost, we had Bob and Nick mm-hmm. with us too. And say if uh, we try our best to get some of our ghostly favorites on those calls, uh, those um, online meetups, and we, again we're on Discord, just having a lot of fun. Yeah, and I might have mentioned it to Jacob, and he might have said he's already down for it. So I'm just saying. I mean, yep. I didn't tell him the date, though, so... So we'll see. No promises, but we, yeah. we definitely try. Um, I do want to give special thanks to our VIP patrons. Now, I want to say something. Okay. We consider them to be like producers of Ghostly. Almost. Absolutely. Um, they help us um, and tell us things that they want to hear and what they want us to focus on, and we listen. Absolutely. Not 100%, but pretty damn close to that. <laughs> definitely. Uh, so I'm going to start it off. And or you know why don't why don't you start off the list? Oh, Ladies okay. first. Okay, so we have Ta. We have Ernie. Marisol. We have Shayla. Cindy. Nicole. Darnay. Jessica. Sarah. Linda. Alice. Austin. Hope. And Candy. Thank you, everybody. But until next time, stay ghostly. Bye.